Hey, this is Larry Thomas, the Soup Nazi from Seinfeld, and I just want to say, no soup for you, Mr. Media. Today on Mr. Media, I'll welcome rock and roll photographer Robert Knight, star of the new documentary film, Rock Prophecies. Stick around. Hey, did you know that you can listen to the latest Mr. Media show right on your phone with the Stitcher app? Stitcher is smart radio for your smartphone. Mr. Media is on demand and on the go with Stitcher. Download Stitcher for your phone today. Get the free app at www.stitcher.com. That's S-T-I-T-C-H-E-R.com. So much media. So little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media interview. You know, MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com. Stop by and check it out. There are more than 600 archived celebrity interviews for your listening pleasure. The show is brought to you today by ThePartyAuthority.us. Planning a wedding, mitzvah, or corporate event? For any and all occasions, call The Party Authority nationwide at 1-800-DIAL-DJs. That's 1-800-342-5357, where one call does it all. Mr. Media was recorded live in the new new media capital of the world and home of the second best team in baseball, St. Petersburg, Florida. Now, maybe you don't already know the name of legendary rock and roll photographer Robert Knight, but by the end of this half hour, you won't be able to forget him. Knight shot the last photographs of guitarist Stevie Ray Vaughan before his fateful plane crash. And he took one of the most iconic pictures ever of Jimi Hendrix. Elton John was once his house guest, slashed through a party to celebrate a show of his work. That's Robert's work. One of the first concerts he shot was, a teenage, was as a teenager slipping to the front of the stage at an early Led Zeppelin show, his professionalism causing everyone, the band included, to believe he belonged there, when he didn't. <laughs> Night is the subject of Rock Prophecies, a new documentary film broadcast and released by PBS. It captures not just the man at work, but also his devotion to many of his subjects, as well as his personal trials, such as taking over the care of his Alzheimer's-affected mother after the death of his father. And when Knight met a gifted young Texas guitarist named Tyler Dow Bryant, he sensed the spirit of the late Stevie Ray Vaughan in the teen's skills and personality. And over the years, and sometimes the objections of the boy's father, Knight introduced Bryant to the music industry. For a little taste of Rock Prophecies, check out this trailer. The camera has afforded me this ability to enter all these realms that I probably couldn't have gotten into. What do I do? I get paid to see. I mean, I've had people say, what was it like working with Jimmy Hendrix? Did you have any idea? I didn't ask anybody. I walked in, I walked to the front of the stage, I had a camera, and they figured, well, you must be with the band, had a camera. These young bands that maybe a lot of people don't pay much attention to, that's sort of what I look for now. Some people collect stamps, some people collect butterflies. I think I kind of collect rock stars. This fall, you know, I'm, I'm 58 years old, I'm wondering, do I have a career? Legendary photographer Robert Knight is on a new mission. And I stumbled across this kid, Tyler Dow Bryant, so I had to go see what this kid was about. To find the next rock god. I am putting my reputation on the line that I am hearing something in Tyler Dow Bryant. Once in a while you run into a player that you hear something here. Hello? Hey Tyler, it's Robert. What's up, Robert? Got some pretty good news for you. Follow the amazing journey. The teacher told her I had an identity crisis. Like I thought I was Elvis. <laughs> of two creative geniuses. And you feel that energy of them rising, and you get to watch that look in their eyes. From two very different worlds. He said, Mom, I'm going to learn to play the guitar. I said, the what? He said, the guitar. Who have only one shot. He's obsessive and he's fearless. <laughs> oh, my God, this is just unbelievable. To make history. If you're really good, someone's going to notice you. This Tyler Dow Bryant. Rock Prophecy. 
And I often say, you have to be careful what you wish for, because it might happen. Rock Prophecies features interviews with and performances by Jeff Beck, ZZ Top, Carlos Santana, Slash, Panic at the Disco, Sick Puppies, Kenny Wayne Shepherd, Rick Nielsen of Cheap Trick, and Steve Vai. The, one, the film won Audience Awards at the AFI Dallas Film Festival, the, Na- the Nashville Film Festival, and the Maui Film Festival, and goes on sales in stores and online on September 14th. It will also be broadcast on American Public Television later this fall. Now, if you love rock photography, you should also check out some earlier Mr. Media interviews with Bob Gruen, Charles Gatewood, and Tom Weschler at MrMedia.com. But now, Robert Knight, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you, sir. I'm glad to be on. Glad to have you. Enjoyed watching the film. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I, actually, I, I made it must-watching for my uh, daughter, who's a uh, almost 14-year-old uh, Guitar player, and uh, uh, she found it very interesting as well. So, you know, yeah, we need more of those. I tell you, I've searched, and I haven't found that many young girls that play the guitar. And um, hopefully, uh, this will be an inspiration for young girls as well to go out there and pick up that guitar and wail. Uh, that's a surprise. Uh, uh, an older man searching for young young girls looking to play guitar. <laughs> no, but I mean, he just seemed to find young guys that all like Stevie Ray. You know, he's just, you know, there's like only a handful of female guitarists in the world. Uh, I'm just, just kidding. One of them is in the movie, Orianti. She's a young Australian girl. She makes a brief appearance in the movie. Mm. It, it is interesting. I, I never expected to see my daughter play like like she plays, and it, yeah, I mean, you do expect it more of uh, uh, boys than girls, but it is, it's very cool to see. But um, yeah. Robert, do you ask yourself, I mean, I got to the end of this movie and I thought, you know, there's an awful lot of men and women out there shooting rock concerts and musicians. Not many of them whose work, though, towers above the others. Do you ever ask yourself, why me? What what, what, what I do differently? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, there's so many guys out there that are my age that I work with. And um, I was kind of surprised when um, Tim Kaiser and John Chester wanted to do the project on me because I'm a big fan of other photographers as well, but, um, you know, I guess it was the devotion to the people that, you know, it was all about the music and being devoted to the artists that I worked with over 40 years that they found a resonating story. How did they find you? I mean, uh, you know, were you looking for something like this? No, this was something that I actually never pursued because I always had an issue with photographers who somehow became more important than the people they were taking pictures of. And so I never wanted to be in a movie or ever thought about doing that. And one day I get a call uh, from a friend of mine who wanted me to come down to the set of a TV show with producer Tim Kaiser, who did Will and Grace and Seinfeld. And he was interested in doing something on Ronnie Wood. And I worked with Ronnie. He and I have the same agent for our artwork. He's a friend of mine, and so I came down and I was talking to Tim Kaiser about Ronnie and then basically tried to talk him out of doing anything with Ronnie because I didn't think Mick Jagger would really appreciate it under the circumstance. And the the day went on for hours, and by the end of that day, he'd offered me, you know, a possibility of doing either a reality show or a documentary about me and my work, and I was quite stunned. Hmm. I turned down the first offer, and then a couple of days later, he called me back and said, well, how can we do this? I think this would be really interesting. And I said, I wanted it to be about the people that blessed me and allowed me to take their picture. So we went down that path, and Rock Prophecies is what we came up with. Were you ever skeptical about having your privacy invaded and, and your work and your work habits put under a microscope? Uh, very. I mean, you know, I mean... Uh, if you don't seek this sort of thing and you don't seek personal publicity, it is interesting when you have cameras in the house and someone follows you around for two years and and is actually getting involved with your process. You know, some of it was quite irritating and some of it was fantastic. You know, there were scenes where I was shooting with Panic at the Disco where the equipment was failing and he managed to get that. And I almost lashed out at the director because it was like I was actually trying to do a shoot and, and cope with a film being done at the same time. But... Um, it was an interesting process, you know, when you work with a director, and especially one that really has a vision, 
and the vision may not be your vision, but you kind of, you know, you bounce back and forth in and out of friendship and, and respect, and but yet that's kind of what makes the project work is that it's sort of like Guns N' Roses or Aerosmith, that volatile relationship between the director, I suppose, and the subject. So that was definitely there. Yeah. And it, it, it's... Uh... How did you get the band, or how did uh, how did get how did Kaiser get the bands to agree not only to let you into the pit as you might you know for any show to shoot, but also to let his cameras in there shoot you while you're shooting them? I thought that was insane. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, on this film, because it was an independent film and we didn't have a you know major budget, and we got budget as we went along the way, most of those calls came from me to the artist. Oh. I had to call up Def Leppard, or I had to call up ZZ Top, and. And, um, you know, that wasn't a problem. I mean, they welcomed it, bring it on, can I be part of it kind of thing. And it was the same thing with the music because, uh, you know, a lot of times the record companies or the management companies didn't want uh, the music to be used. They would never use it in a documentary. And, and you know, the good case would be Elton John. And, uh, the, you know, we were turned down by the label repeatedly, and the director really wanted the Elton John piece. And so I called Elton, and he said, what do you need? I said, we need Saturday Night's All Right for Flight, and he said, you can have it. <laughs> and the next day we had it clear. We so were personal relationships. I mean, 40 years I worked with these guys and never asked them for anything. Right. You know? And so this is also the unnerving thing when you were making the movies, you were calling in favors. <laughs> you know? And I was like, oh, geez, you know, like going to Jeff Beck. Um, you know, he doesn't let people into the house, and he doesn't play on demand. And when then I called Jeff and said, you know, they're doing a documentary on my life and work, the first thing he said was, can I be in it? <laughs> so that was a good sign. Well, yeah, see, and that's what I wanted to ask you, too, is, I mean, you know, I, I, you know I, doing what I do, I've gotten to know, you know, some, some, some people with some celebrity over the years, and, and the idea of ever going to any of them and asking them for a favor would unnerve me because, A, I'd hate to ask for that favor because you never ask, and B, if they turn you yeah. down, what a slap to the ego that would be. <laughs> yeah, I know. And guess what? I was turned down. I mean, you know, there were people that I called and said, absolutely no way. <laughs> so, you know, you win some, you lose some. But um, there were people that we wanted that it just didn't work out timing-wise. Mm -hmm. I mean, Aerosmith um, was somebody I really wanted to interact with, and I recently have been on the road with them. But at the time, there was all this tumultuous stuff going on, and it just didn't work out. So, uh, but um, and you know, you take you take a 42 year career and you reduce it to 80 minutes. That was the part that I had to wrap my head around. I, I kind of felt bad because there were people that are very significant in my life that didn't get put in the movie, and then those that were in there maybe got you know far less time than say Tyler Bryant. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it was about the story, and and the director John Chester really started to see a storyline and then at the end of the film I look at it and I go oh my god this is really really amazing what he did I mean because at the time I was sort of going what what is happening you know I thought one of the most amazing things and you, and you just uh, uh, referred to it was you going to uh, Beck's home and you know yes. hanging out with that I mean because yeah I mean this is a guy that we don't know a whole lot about we don't we haven't been you know the public generally has not been up close and personal with him and uh you know suddenly there you were in his house i know and you know he's a very reclusive guy i mean you, if you look over at videos until the ronnie scott's thing came out there was nothing available on jeff and even the thing that he did for himself there was nothing really personal in there you weren't going through his house or looking at his guitars or you know it was all outside of the state but um but I've been so passionate from day one about Jeff Beck. And, and to my mind, he just keeps reinventing and reinventing the guitar and has pushed it further than any of those other guys from that era. You know, um, and, and so for to me, he's always breaking new ground. And so I think Jeff realizes that, you know, I've been championing him for years. And, and you know, the director, when we showed up, he said, well, you know, Jeff is going to play, right? And I said, well, you can't. Ask Jeff Beck to play on demand. I mean, it's Jeff Beck. And he goes, oh, no, no, I didn't come all this way and not have him play. And I thought, oh, geez. So he asked Jeff. I left the room. I stood outside. And I just waited. But he got over 40 minutes of Jeff doing impromptu music that we didn't need to license because, it, you know, we had to be very conscious if he was playing songs that were copywritten by other people. So what, you know, to me, this was the most stellar thing that we did. And, you know, like John says, if it was up to Robert, the whole movie would be about Jeff Beck. But 
once you got Jeff Beck in the can and you call up Carlos Santana or you call up another guitar player and they go, okay, tell me about the documentary, who's in it? And you go, Jeff Beck, and they go, I'm in. Right. So that was what I told John. If we get Jeff Beck first, everybody will like us, you know. Well, and another guy who's in there was a little surprising uh, because I just think of him as immensely private and maybe even a little shy, was Flash. Yeah. And it, it, interestingly enough, we shot an op- you know, we did shoot with Slash. And it would happen to be the day that Scott Weiland's wife burned all his clothes. And they were in the middle of trying to do a Velvet Revolver uh, album or rehearsal or something. And it was nothing but an uproar. And we were shooting Slash on that particular day. And he was just so frustrated. He was so upset. And he really didn't give me the kind of thing that I knew Slash was capable of giving me. So we waited a couple of weeks. We shot the Jeff Beck sequence. I came back. I showed it to Slash. I said, Jeff, look at this. Uh, look at what we did with Jeff Beck. And, and Slash said, you're right. Let's redo it. So I see, said, let's come up with something. And we broke into Fairfax High School. I mean, we didn't have permission. And we went in there and we drove his, you know, Austin Martin vanquished through the hallways of where he was thrown <laughs> out. I mean, it was unbelievable. And then the security came and tried to throw us out. And, and, um, and we cut a deal with them because Slash had gone there, and apparently there was a neon sign saying, Slash and Chili Peppers, please call home. They wanted him to come back and help the Alumni Association. So we kind of worked out a deal and continued to shoot. But Slash then talked about things that, you know, you normally wouldn't expect to hear out of him, mm-hmm. you know, about high school and about cutting ditch in school and, and just, you know, that kind of OCD that these kids have when they're younger, when they even see musical instruments being set up on stage, they're excited. The lights drop down, they're excited. So he kind of captured that this little thing that I was trying to explain that happens to me when I go to a concert still at my age and the lights drop down. There's such an adrenaline rush about what is about to start. So I'm still excited. I mean, working with Aerosmith over the last couple weeks has just brought that all back home again. Well, uh, we're going to take a, just a quick 20, 30-second break. Uh, this is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to the Mr. Media Radio interview with rock and roll photographer Robert Knight, who is featured in the new documentary film, Rock Prophecies. And we'll be right back. Ever thought of hosting your own radio show? Now you can by registering at blogtalkradio.com. While you're there, check out our selection of premium packages. To start your own show today, visit blogtalkradio.com. And this is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to the Mr. Media Radio interview with rock photographer Robert Knight, featured in the new film Rock Prophecies. Um, Robert, early in the film, you uh, talk about resisting some pretty huge offers to sell the rights to your photos of Stevie Ray Vaughan, which were, of course, the last the last one shot of him before his accident. Yeah. How much money have you been offered for that, and why do you always say no to that? Well, I mean, at the time, you know, that it was like a very important shoot, and he asked me personally to be there. I'd become a really good friend of Stevie's. You know, the last two years of his life, I was out on tour with Jeff back with him in 89, and, and we'd become really close, and he asked me to be back there to shoot this important photo of him and Eric Clapton and everything. And it was a very, you know, interesting two couple of days together, and then to wake up the next morning and find out he was gone, and then suddenly... You know, people were calling me that have never called me before, wanting those pictures. It was like a frenzy of people trying to get at it, and I just really was upset at the exploitation of this. So I sat out on it for a couple of years, did nothing, and then his publicist, Charlie Comer, called me and said, Robert, you should let the photos out. Stevie got them out. So we slowly let them out, but they don't usually get associated with that horrible day, you know. Mm-hmm. And then uh, later in the in the film... You you accept an offer from Jimi Hendrix's sister to sell the rights to, I think I think it was to sell the rights to your iconic photo of Jimi. And why did you make that sale? Well, what it was was that you know my situation with my mother got way out of control when my dad died, and my mother's Alzheimer's just kicked in, and she immediately needed to be put into twenty four hour a day assisted living, and and you know the cost of this was just prohibited. She didn't have any insurance. She sort of fell between the cracks in the social service system, having too big of a social security check to qualify. So I, I was in a sort of financial bind, and it was very quickly, and Janie Hendricks was around me at the time, and I told her about it, and she just offered me to help. She offered to give me some money, 
And I said, Janie, why don't we work something out? So what she did is she bought the copyright of 150 photos that I did of Jimi Hendrix mm. and gave me the money that I needed to cover everything. But in exchange, I had the right and blessing of the Hendrix estate to sell those photos for the rest of my life and keep the money. So she got all the licensing rights, the copyright, and all the stuff you can do with posters, T-shirts, and everything like that. So it was a total win-win. Hmm. I'm still associated with the work. I can still sell the prints, and she's free to do those things with those images that you know really that she could do that I couldn't do probably anyway. You know, so it was like an angel at the time, and, and it really helped the situation. So I, I, you know, kudos to Janie Hendricks. And how, how is your mom at this point? Has anything changed? Well, you know, it, for having Alzheimer's, the cycle has been a very long one, and she's still alive, but but she's in that zone where there's a sort of complete shutdown of who you are, where you are, why you are. She no longer has any recognition of me. It's a horrible situation for me to, to look at, but at the same time, she's not sick. I mean, physically ill, as we can tell. So mm -hmm. uh, never gets cold, never gets flus, and, you know, she's in a 24-hour-a-day, you know, locked down in a bed with people watching her. You know, it's, it's really quite dreadful, really, for me to see this. Any second thoughts uh, about uh, including her in the uh, in the documentary at this point? Well, I didn't originally want to, but John Chester said, let's do it, and if you don't like it, we'll cut it out, which is a great line that directors use. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I was not happy because I just like, well, you know, this is a very personal thing. But then I started thinking about it, and I started thinking, you know, there's a lot of people probably my age that are going through this that – you know, probably can identify with this. So when I saw it, I said, look, at least it's a testimony to my mom when she could still walk and sort of, sort of interact with me. And, um, and then, you know, as we've shown the movie around the country and film festivals, I've been inundated by people in similar situations that, you know, can relate to the movie, even though they don't know much about rock and roll or even still photography, they really find this compelling backstory of, of just, dealing with an elderly parent under the circumstances, you know. So um, at the end of the day, John Chester did the right thing. I was wrong, you know, by saying I didn't want it in there. But now, you know, in hindsight, this is what probably made a very profound movie. Now, the movie also gives us a peek at another woman in your life. Uh, tell us a little bit about this woman who uh, is by your side and, you know, by the side of a guy who travels as much as you do and has to, you know, keep up with all these young dudes. So what do you think? Well, I have an amazing wife. Her name is Mary Ann Bilham, and she's from New Zealand, and she's also a photographer, and I met her in the 80s in Hong Kong. And, you know, she deals, She has traveled the world, and she does what I do. So it was like somebody in my life that totally understood what I do, and I could understand what she did. And um, she moved over to America in the early 90s, and, you know, we've traveled the world. We've shot together. And um, we've opened the gallery together in Las Vegas, but yet she's very much her own person as a photographer. And she's working on some wonderful uh, one-woman shows and some books and things coming up. But she's a, she's a much better technical photographer than I am. I'm more of a journalistic uh, guy that captures the moment. I'm really comfortable doing a 90-second, two-minute photo shoot with a rock star where she would really like to work on the conceptual ideas and, you know, really put in the, the all the things that you would put into an amazing photo shoot. So my career is really much more the spontaneous. I really die, you know, live for the live show. I love working very quickly. Um, you know, I'm a well-trained, traditional photography guy that could do film, printing, you know, all of that stuff, but now have embraced the digital world because you have no choice um, and, and, you know, have mastered that. And I, 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 I could not uh, let us finish without asking you about uh, uh, Tyler uh, Dow Bryant, the prodigy that you uh, noticed uh, in his teens. And you, there, I mean, there's two elements of that story. One, of course, is that you talk about uh, f feeling the spirit of Stevie Ray Vaughan in him, but also, despite all of his talent, his dad uh, at, at one point puts down his foot and said, no, you're not going to do a record contract. You're going to finish school, and, and one day you'll thank me for it. And we we see this glimpse of of uh, Tyler's mom, who is either in tears or near tears, of, about being caught between this situation. Uh, that uh, you know. Yeah, no. It, it, this came out of John Chester 
asking me to find several young artists that nobody had ever heard of and do what I did back in the early 60s and 70s with bands like Led Zeppelin and predict that, you know, they were going to make it. So with Tyler, I heard about him when he won the Robert Johnson Blues Award. I put him on Eric Clapton's radar. He was invited to play the Crossroads in 2007, which he did. Um, and when I went to the parents, and they had already kind of been through the drama of, you know, the record offer and all that, getting flown on private jets to Nashville. And the dad said, listen, I want him to finish high school. You can start down the path with him, but he is finishing school before he can do everything. So we got Tyler on an accelerated program where he finished early, finished with honors, and moved him to Nashville. We arranged a showcase for CAA. They signed him on the spot. And... Tyler just is on a three-week tour right now with Ario Speedwagon and Pat Benatar. And another young guitar player I know, Graham Whitford, who is the son of Brad Whitford from Aerosmith, he's joined Tyler's band. And about a week and a half ago, the boys opened for Aerosmith in New York, which was just, for Tyler, I would imagine, an amazing thing in one year. But the irony was that day that they played opening for Aerosmith was August 26th, and that was the day Stevie played his last show so 20 years to the day i've got tyler and graham opening for errol smith and that was the anniversary of stevie ray vaughn's last performance so for me the life was imitating art wow wow well uh, folks listen rock prophecies featuring uh, photographer robert knight goes on sale in stores and online on september 14th it will also be broadcast on american public television later this fall and you can order the DVD right now at a great price on MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com. Uh, Robert, can folks find you uh, online? Do, do you have a website? A yeah, Twitter, I, I am. Um, if you can go to the Knight Gallery. It's Knight-Gallery.com. You can look at a lot of photos. Uh, I'm on Facebook under Robert M. Knight. Um, there's a book called Rock Gods, which is almost companion to the movie, um, which are, you know, a 42-year overview of my uh, archive. So there, you know, and I, I'm actually being inundated by a lot of young artists at the moment because they've seen the movie or heard about it, and then they hear about Tyler, and so I must get five, six young guitar players a month that are, you know, connecting with me, and some of them are unbelievable, wow. and um, I'm working with quite a few of them right now. Wow. Well, I, I must say that I very much enjoyed uh, the film, and. Uh, Wish you a lot of luck with that, and uh, you know the best for you and your wife, and of course your mother. And yeah. uh, thank you so much for joining us on Mr. Media today. And thank you. All right. Best of luck to you, sir. Thank you, Bob. Bye bye. Yeah. And for more interviews with uh, right. America's top rock photographers, as I mentioned at the top of the show, surf over to our main website, mrmedia.com. That's mrmedia.com. And you can now hear Mr. Media while you're on the go with Stitcher Radio. Stitcher is a free news and talk mobile application. The latest episode of Mr. Media is always available for you there. No syncing needed and no memory wasted. It's available for your iPhone, your Palm Pre, Android phones, or your BlackBerry. Downloading is easy, so go to Stitcher.com or check out the App Store for your individual mobile phone. And while you're there, check out some of my favorite online radio shows, including WTF with Mark Marin, The Nerdist, Inside Radio, Doug Loves Movies, and Sex with Emily. And please take advantage of this great offer for Mr. Media radio listeners. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash mrmedia to get a free audiobook download of your choice when you sign up today. Again, that's audiblepodcast.com slash mrmedia for your free audiobook. Subscribe to Mr. Media on iTunes and you'll never miss a show. Just search Mr. Media Interviews from within iTunes and subscribe for free. And while you're there... Write a review. Give us a few rating points. And you can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many locations. If you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at bob at mrmedia.com. And you can follow me on Facebook or Twitter, twitter.com slash Andelman, or on Facebook, just search Mr. Media Interviews. Thanks so much for joining us today. Always appreciate it when you give up a little piece of your day and come spend it with us. Thanks for listening. <laughs>